What is going on, Colts Nation? Welcome back to another Bring the Juice Colts podcast live stream. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to everybody that is coming in here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. We kind of wanted to just chat a little bit about uh, some things that need to happen over the next month before we hit the draft. Thank you to everybody who is in here right now. Uh, be sure to like the stream, guys. It helps it get out to more people uh, if you do. So please make sure to like the stream wherever you're watching. Uh, be sure to comment if you haven't already. And be sure to subscribe if you guys haven't already. Uh, support on the channel has been really great over the last month. And we greatly appreciate you guys doing that. Um, well, Cody, I mean, we kind of heard the news from two days ago. Uh, we kind of chatted about it uh, that night, Friday night, but while I was pretty much almost asleep at that point. And we had finally heard that Legereus Sneed is on the move. Uh, unfortunately, just not to the Indianapolis Colts. It is to the Tennessee Titans after all. Um, and the trade ends up being finalized to where uh, they're giving up a uh, set. What was it? A seventh rounder this year and a third rounder next year, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, very interesting. Um, you know, you and I definitely uh, already knew that the Colts were pretty high on the uh, on the trade compensation, but it ultimately came down to the contract. Um, we saw that it was a four year and I think it was a what? Seventy six million dollar deal, which was nineteen million a year. But that was not the biggest factor in all of this. Uh, 55 of the 70 really guaranteed for Legereus Sneed, which, Cody, I just looked it up. That would have been more than $10 million more in guaranteed money than the highest next player in the NFL of all time, who De Denzel Ward just got uh, a few years ago where he got 44 and a half million of his $101 million contract that he got. So, I mean, just looking at it, you know, it's it definitely, that was the biggest stepping stone there. Legereus Snee was not willing to back down from the guaranteed money. Ballard uh, didn't want to give him that. And the Tennessee Titans ended up doing it. So, I mean, just kind of taking obviously a few days now to kind of look at it. Um, what's your thoughts on the contract and him going to the Tennessee Titans? What's kind of been your viewpoint on that? Well, at first livid because you're like Chris Ballard. You've now allowed multiple players who are impact and really good players to go to division rivals, you know, and, and I think that was kind of the initial reaction um, it's just like, really, like you're, you're allowing seemingly all of these division teams to move ahead of you when it comes to, you know, um, acquiring these really, really good players, you know, and I know it's going to cost a little bit, but then you look at it, Derek, and you say all these other teams uh, right now have these young quarterbacks on these rookie deals, you know, so they're able to be a little bit more flexible. And it just seems like the Colts, sometimes they get stuck being complacent. I think that's just kind of where. You stand on it. But Derek, when you do look at the money a little bit more, I don't think the compensation was necessarily the issue. Like you talked about, it was that contract, you know, 55 million guaranteed for a guy that's what, you know, going to be what, 28 years old. Um, so, you know, higher 20 type of player, although he was really good last year. Don't get me wrong, man. Like we know, we know how good Legereus need is. We wanted Legereus yeah. need no question about it. Um, but that is a lot of money to pay to a guy that, you know, has never been an all pro has never been a pro bowl player. Um, although he was really good last year, but to make him, like you said, over $10 million higher than the next rated guy, I guess that's the thing that you had to weigh Derek. And I know there were some concerns also with Legereus needs uh, injury. Like there were some injury concerns. I heard a little bit about that. And so I think maybe that was why on top of, you know, are we going to really, you know, first off, are we going to, are we willing to pay a guy that much over, uh, for a guy that, I, you know, as good as Legereus Need is, Derek, is he a top five corner in this league? Uh, you can have an argument one way or another, but I would say probably not, even though I think he still is a really, really good player in his own right. 
Um, so I think like all those factors are probably what made Indy kind of back off a little bit from the initial offer. But I get why the fan reaction has been as frustrated and, and admittedly from me as well is because yeah. you look at that, every single team has done some significant things this year. And it is a and it is not very, you know, attractive when really all you've done, Derek, up to this point for the Indianapolis Colts is you've resigned a lot of your guys, which I know is frustrating because it's not really new. Uh, and then right. you've added a couple of players, and that's all you've done this off season. And so I totally understand from a fan perspective why it is frustrating. Don't get me wrong. I was as mad as anybody on that Friday night when I found that out. It's like really like you're gonna sit on your hands uh-huh. again, but you know, as you've taken some a couple days here and processed a little bit, I think that it, that some of those factors maybe make it make a little more sense into why the Colts were maybe not as crazy and gung ho on you know paying Legarius need that much guaranteed. You know what I mean? And so um, that's kind of where I stand on it right now. But saying that, Derek, the Colts have to do some stuff. Like there's there's no question. You still need to add. I would oh, yeah. say multiple veterans in your secondary at this point, Derek, because, you know, in, and we talked about it even prior to free agency, Derek, we said corner, at least I don't know where you stood on it, but I said corners, not necessarily like one that I'm saying you absolutely have to go all the way in and get like that true, like, guy. you know, like you don't have to like go overhaul the whole corner position. Like we maybe believe you have to do with the safety position. Like we would say mm-hmm. safety is probably more of a significant need, because you actually have some guys in the pipeline with corner, although you would like to add a veteran because that's been the biggest thing. You know, Kenny Moore's a great veteran, but an outside veteran. You'd like to add a guy that can play a little bit more outside for you. Um, so I would say that, you know, for, for me, when I look at that, I say safety is still a massive, massive need. And I think I'll be a lot more harsher on Chris Ballard if we go into the draft and you still don't have an answer at safety because there's not really a ton of safeties here, Derek, um, you know, in the draft that you're like, this is not like the wide receiver class when it comes to safeties. It's not even like the corner class when it comes to safeties. And so I think that's where when you're the Indianapolis Colts, you you got to figure this out. And Derek, the, the good news, I guess, for the Colts is that there still are some guys that you think you bring in and they could be legitimate like uh, helpers for this secondary. There's legitimate guys out there. And I know the thumbnail points to two of those guys that are still available. And also, Derek, you keep all your draft capital. And I know it wasn't that much. So, you know, at right. the end of the day, that's not the biggest thing here. But, uh, you know, you can maybe sign a guy like Xavier Howard, who I know, you know, has – had moments where he's looked like one of the better corners in the league. And then he's had moments where he's kind of looked pretty average, you know? So that, and then there's a few safeties still available that you're like, they could be pretty big upgrades from what you currently have. But right. yeah, that's really where I stand, Derek, when it comes to the luxurious need stuff. Um, and definitely still have my opinion on Chris Ballard. And sometimes you do feel like, man, is can you win with him at GM with just how stubborn he is at times? And how unwilling he is at times to take a swing. You know what I mean? But yeah, I get why. But yeah, it can just from a fan perspective be very frustrating to watch your division rivals seemingly getting better around you. So I totally understand yeah. that sentiment. I totally get it. Yeah. And I'm right there with you. I mean, it's it's one of those things I have to I I wish that more people would be vocal about seeing it from both ends here and saying that. Look, that contract is ridiculous. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, it, it, night, the 19 million a year thing is not a big deal. What I'm saying, I would have been okay with that kind of contract. But again, it's the guaranteed money. You're giving this guy more guaranteed money than any other player at that position in the NFL. And like you said, well, Jerry Sneed's a really good corner. He's not a, but he's not an elite corner. And he's, and we're certainly at a point where, I mean, you're right. If that injury ends up, you know, becoming more of a concern is it's a, it's a big problem with a guarantee, right? Cause the, the players want the guarantee in case the injuries start happening and the teams don't want to give somebody guaranteed money because if they end up getting hurt two out of those uh, four years that you're paying this guy, you're going to have to pay him that money regardless. Right? So that's that's where the guarantee just comes into play. Ultimately, we will know at the end of the day if 
that contract was worth it if Legereus Need ends up playing the majority of the games and if uh and if he ends up being extremely productive with the Tennessee Titans organization. And I don't know how their def- how he's going to respond in their division in their defense because their defense is certainly different than the Kansas City Chiefs. But at the same time, you're right. Like it's been difficult for us to kind of sit back and say Indy has brought a lot of their core foundation guys back. And uh but at the same time, like you know, these other teams, they're not bringing a lot of their same guys back. They're gonna just go and spend a lot of this money on outside guys. I mean, you're right. When it comes to the Tennessee Titans, what have they done? Regardless if they're overspending, I'm not making this argument of saying the, uh, these teams are overspending for these players. That at the end of the day isn't what I'm talking about. You're right. The Tennessee Titans brought in two good corners. That is definitely an improvement from what they had. Uh, they brought in Calvin Ridley who is definitely one of their better wide receivers that they've had in that building since AJ Brown left, uh, regardless of it being an overpay, they still brought in a good wide receiver for Will Levis. Their offensive line is going to get better this off season because they're most likely going to draft one of the better offensive linemen in the draft. Uh, they got Peter Skaronsky there at the guard spot. They brought in uh, Lloyd Cushenberry at their center position. So their left side of their O line is, you know, kind of, it kind of feels like the same thing that the Colts did in 2018, where they brought in like an overhaul of, you know, these players coming in at the offensive line to try to figure it out. Um, they got, and they brought in what's up. Oh yeah. They brought in Pollard. You know, would I say he's going to be more impactful than Derrick Henry? I don't think so, but I mean, you're right. He, they brought in Pollard. It's not like they're dropping off. Like, extraordinarily, but they are dropping off in the running back category. But then again, the offense is going to look different now with a new coach in uh, Brian Callahan and his offensive guys, you know, like what are they going to do over there uh, in Tennessee differently than what Vrabel used to do? Because that was a very old classic uh, sort of situation. At the end of the day, we keep talking about it. Will Levis is going to be the ultimate deciding factor in that. Uh, whoever ends up, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much improvement they make. If Will Levis doesn't turn the corner and Will Levis isn't able to, you know, be a more consistent quarterback, then ultimately it doesn't matter what they do. They're only going to win seven or eight games a year going forward. So it that's how it is. And then, you know, I'm more concerned with the fact of, you know, just the Texans. My issue is, is it's not the Jags or the Titans because I firmly believe that the Indianapolis Colts, even if we left, brought everyone back that we needed to bring back. And if we brought back Julian Blackman, we made one move in the secondary. We drafted a secondary guy, all of this stuff. I still feel extremely confident that Indy will be better than Tennessee and has a chance of competing with the Jaguars for the division. But the problem you have is with the Texans have already shown they're on the they're on a good level right now, Cody. We, we saw they won the division. They won a playoff game. They smacked the Cleveland Browns in the playoffs. And then it seems like they got better because, you know, they brought in a better pass rusher, albeit he's not he's older. He's not going to be there for much, much longer, but they brought in a couple secondary guys. They improved at the running back room, you know, and they might draft a wide receiver, um, you know, in the draft that's going to give CJ Stroud another weapon, you know. So it's it's definitely one of those things where it feels like the Texans, who are already at the pinnacle of the top of the division, got better, whereas Indy is really remaining the same at this moment. And I know that Indy had a chance to beat the Texans late in the season to make win the division. Like that's, that's true. We were, we were this close even without Anthony Richardson and all, and JT was not 100% healthy at that point in the season, but it definitely feels like the Texans got a little bit better from a personnel perspective. And we already know that their quarterback head coach combo is really, really good. 
and they were also rookies as well. So I'm not worried about what the Tennessee Titans are doing right now or what the Jaguars are doing right now. I feel more importantly about what are we doing to compete against the Texans because they are going to control the narrative of this division for the next couple years if Indy doesn't end up doing something bigger. So, I mean, I, I, I feel like we're kind of just at the point of competing with the Texans to see who's going to win the division. But I don't know, man. This, it seems like a lot. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know what the next step is for Indy. Um, what do you think is the next thing that we have to do? Like, is it cornerback first? Is it safety first? What do you think uh, needs to be addressed first here? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up that idea of Indy just staying the same because, Derek, I think this is the very reason if, you know, if, say, Indy takes a step back for some reason in 2025, like just say they go from winning nine games to six or seven. Just just, just stay with me here. Okay. I feel like that is something, Derek, that we've seen the Colts and Chris Ballard do that's been the biggest Achilles heel for him. I mean, think about that, Derek. After 2020, I mean, the Colts made the playoffs. They nearly took down the Buffalo Bills. What the heck did they do in the offseason outside of Carson Wentz? They did nothing. They didn't get anybody, really, Derek. Did they? I don't I don't think they really like went crazy. Like, you know, they didn't really get any guys that made that big of an impact. And I think it came back to bite them in certain ways, Derek. Just the complacency of we're good where we're at, you know, and, and I get that to a degree, but also I just I I wonder, Derek, if the fact that the Indianapolis Colts felt like they were that close, which they were led them to feel like they could be a little bit more complacent. And I think that could be very dangerous if you're sitting there feel, feeling like we're fine and we're one pass away, which is true. I don't know. I just, I just, that, I don't like that kind of thinking, you know, like where we're like, we're okay. Like, I just don't feel like, I feel like you always need to be looking to ways to improve. And sometimes I just don't think you utilize free agency for what it should be. And I think that's where Chris Ballard, honestly, Derek, has gotten himself into trouble before. I mean, we've looked, it feels like every year there's a certain position where the Colts devalue it and it comes back to bite them in the butt. I mean, we saw multiple times, Derek, where this has happened. You know, the one that obviously always rings true to me is the, the neglect at left tackle back in 2022, you know, and I know it all ultimately worked out with Bernard Ryman, but you had a year there where that really cost you, even last year with the cornerback position. I mean, Derek, you went young and and that cost you multiple games, you know, where you could have been sitting in the playoffs. And so I guess when I sit here, I say that is the biggest thing that concerns me is the fact that it feels like the Colts are kind of just being OK with being where they were. You know what I mean? They think now, again, I, I understand that line of thinking because we talked about it. You had a backup quarterback, a backup running back. But don't you just want to get if you have the opportunity to get even better? Like, don't you want to take advantage of that? I, and, and that's where I just fundamentally disagree with what Chris Ballard's doing and how the Colts approach their roster building. And look, I'm not saying go and do what the Tennessee Titans did and go hand out all this guaranteed money. Uh, but I do think you need to add some talent. You can't be where you were because, Derek, to think that everything's going to be linear from where it was in 2023 to, or 2024, excuse me, uh, to where it could be in 2025, I just don't think that is like a logical step that you should make. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's not inevitably something's not going to be as good as it was a season ago. And so that's just kind of the nature of it, Derek. And so I just don't necessarily love that. And, and I do think Indianapolis going to your question, I do think safety has to be the more primary need. I think you need to, at this point, Julian Blackman's your best option at strong safety. And I do think Derek, you need to seriously consider you know, adding a veteran at free safety. I mean, if you go into this season, Derek, with Nick Cross or Rodney Thomas slated to start at free safety, you have failed this offseason. I'll be honest. Like, you have failed this offseason because neither of these players has proven at this point that they deserve a legitimate shot at starting. Like, you've seen things with both of them, more Nick Cross as of recently, but I just think that's foolish, again, to bet on some of these guys when they haven't proven they can be that guy, you know, like even with Bernard Ryman last year, Derek, like you saw positive things um, and he started playing like one of the better left tackles in the NFL in 2022 that made you feel confident enough that he was going to take that step. And while we saw stuff from a guy like Nick Cross, it was still very inconsistent. And so I just think you need that type of stability back there. 
because that cost you multiple games, Derek, where there was just oh, this yeah. miscommunication, these issues, these mental errors, and all that stuff that really cost you multiple games. And so I think safety for me, if there's one move I want the Colts to make, it's getting a legitimate starting free safety. I think that'll just help you in so many ways. And if you kind of have some guys who are a little bit older and more experienced in that secondary and that safety room, I feel a lot better moving forward. You know, like I was okay, Derek, to be honest with you, to start the off season. Um, I was okay if Indy really didn't do much at corner. And if they went, went young at corner, if on the contingency that they obviously brought back Kenny Moore, and then if they, you know, go and get a veteran guy in the safety room. And, and so if they can do that, I still think there's a way the Colts can come out and still be better from this off season. You know, they, yeah. they added a little bit of depth. Um, at the defensive line, you know, they obviously uh, they added a, a legitimate backup quarterback. Um, so, that you know, that one was kind of linear there, although you may, could make the argument. Maybe Joe Flacco from what he played last year is better than Gardner Minshew, but that's neither here or there. But you do still need to add an outside addition to really help you out in that young secondary. That's very inexperienced. Yeah. You've tried to draft some guys and. You know, you've had some decent success, but still you don't have that legitimate guy back there. So for me, that's where I would focus if I was the Colts right now. I would focus on just really helping to add some experience to that secondary, to that safety room in particular. But, hey, you talked about Xavier Howard, talked about a guy like a killer Witherspoon. Like there's still a few pretty good vets out there that I think could play with some good football for you. But if I'm choosing one, Derek, I am undoubtedly going safety. Oh, a hundred percent. You have to, because it, it's like you said, we saw when Julian Blackman went down, we saw how it was the detriment to the team. It was, it was the detriment to the team. That's why the Colts could not finish games very well. It's because the safety room was not good because when Julian Blackman went down, Rodney Thomas had a, a sophomore slump. Nick cross was only good in situational football and you, that was basically it for you. So you didn't have a good situation. And you're right, Cody. I'm inclined to think the latter that the Indianapolis Colts may just run it back with the cornerback room that they have. Maybe just adding another piece to compete for that num number two outside corner spot. Only because, like, again, we, I think you and I both can agree that Juju Brent's now being fully healthy could go into this off season, learn a lot more, and then should be better, uh, should be better next year, given he's uh, available for majority of the year. And Dallas Flowers, who's just getting back from his Achilles tear. Uh, I mean, people don't want to remember that name, but Dallas Flowers was playing at a average NFL cornerback level, sometimes even above average. Uh, at times early in the season, he was looking like by far the best cornerback on the team at that time uh, went before he went down with his injury. So, I mean, he definitely could be somebody that Ballard's looking to uh, take a gamble on. And of course we yeah. saw with Jalen Jones, Jalen Jones had his bad moments, but he also had some good moments. Uh, it just all really depends on, yeah. you know, he was how a rookie, good is he right? I think, I think we lose sight of the fact that two of the starting outside corners were rookies last year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we just assume that's what their ceiling is. And that that's not necessarily the case. And so, yeah. Um, but and he I, wants yeah, to saying that, Derek, I think you do need to probably add another, another piece in that room, whether that is, you know, you trade back or you take a guy there at 15, you know, I know a lot, there's been a lot of different names, Quinion Mitchell, uh, you know, Terry and Arnold's been another name. Or if you figure, hey, we got a lot of guys on the board here. Let's trade back, you know, and acquire another pick and then, you know, add another piece potentially. Um, but Derek, just because the wide receiver uh, group, and I think that's one we've seen a lot of, you know, the Colts have been at a lot of different uh, pro days with a lot of good wide receivers. And so I do think wide receivers on their radar to upgrade in the draft. But Derek, we talked about how good this, draft class is for wide receiver and how deep it is you know could indianapolis go corner in round one you know even if they do trade back in a scenario like that and then they do go get a wide receiver in round two um you know i could see a scenario where that does happen and i would like to see the colts just add another legitimate investment and i'm talking you know between days one and two that sort of investment into the cornerback room and i think if they do that 
I honestly feel really good about that corner room. I really do. I mean, you know, just adding more competition in that room. Uh, it's obviously contingent on having some answers at safety. Um, but doing that and then adding another weapon, Derek, in the, you know, in on day two, beginning of day two, I'm all right with that. I really am okay with that if Indy did elect to go that route because I think those are the big focuses you need to have is getting a weapon, getting explosion on the offense, and then, you know, obviously helping to limit the big plays on defense. That's what we've heard all offseason. And so I think that's a legitimate way if you did add, you know, somebody in the safety room to help limit that. I mean, I think that's – that's what you would be looking at, man. And I would feel a lot better than I do right now about both those positions. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that that's a legitimate thing that's on the table. I think it really, for me at this point, Derek's probably not that I would necessarily agree with this, but I think for Indianapolis, it's probably corner or wide receiver right now with what they're going to do in round one. So that's what I'm thinking, but could Appreciate be wrong. That, that's just what the vibes I'm getting, you know, like that's just what yeah. I, that's just what I'm feeling about it. But, I've been oh, wrong yeah. before, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see about it for sure. But appreciate that, Jerry. So yeah, we have 551 people watching across uh, X and YouTube right now. Please be sure to like the stream, guys, wherever you're watching. Greatly appreciate it, guys. Um, but Thank yeah, so the Indianapolis Colts right now, Cody, uh, sitting at just over $22 million dollars in uh total cap right now and yep. they said with their effective cap they'd be probably around 16 million dollars 15 million dollars uh which if anyone doesn't know exactly what that means effective cap means that's the cap that you have to be able to basically seclude your 71 man roster over the off season while also leaving enough space for the rookie class coming in yeah. Right. So you have to think mm -hmm. that a certain amount of your cap has to go towards paying for your rookies that you have to draft. Right. And since Indy has a draft it, or has a draft pick in pretty much every round, you're not going to have to worry. You're going to have to worry about how much money you're going to have to pay some of these guys, uh, especially if Indy picks a guy in the first round. It's going to cost a couple million out of you. So it basically, Indy has relatively about 15 to 16 million in cap at this point yeah. in time that they can spend on free agency. And that is plenty of room to be able to sign one or two more guys that could actually do something to actually provide some help in that secondary. There's definitely enough room for it. And then you can address whatever need is there in the draft. Yeah. And Derek, I think we've seen, especially at safety, it feels like we've heard the Colts being connected to multiple safeties out there still right mm -hmm. now. Will they sign them? That's another question, you know, and, and they, I think they need to, uh, but it does appear Derek, like, you know, with the Julian Blackman thing, the culture just let him go out, test his market, see what he's worth. And then they might come back and hopefully they'll negotiate something and figure out a way to keep him. It would just be hard for me to see the Colts just letting Julian Blackman walk, especially because, you know, of how important he was last year to this team when he was on the field. I mean, and I know, Derek, there's been reports, I believe, like Mike Chappell was talking um, on the fan like last week or something about how Julian Blackman's market's not necessarily where he thought it should be, you know, where he thinks it should be. So maybe that is a good sign for Indianapolis. You know, maybe they, they have the set price and Julian's saying, you know, I, I'm worth more. And then he goes out and sees maybe I'm not actually worth that much more. And that that's a good way that he comes back to Indy. Now I'm hoping on that. That would obviously be huge. And then, yeah, you talk about 16 million ish. I mean, you know, between him and, you know, signing, you know, one of those safeties, Quandre Diggs or Justin Simmons. I mean, we'll see Derek, you know, and if this is the contract, like I'd be totally good with that. $5 million for Julian Blackman. Heck yeah. I would take that, you know, leave you 11 million there to be able to get him on a lower contract uh, per average. Yeah. Yeah. So Derek, say you get him in the range of five, six, seven million, somewhere around there. I mean, that still leaves you Derek with roughly 10 ish million, if not a little bit more than that, that you can go sign a Justin Simmons, say Justin Simmons a little bit, obviously wants a little bit more, say he wants eight or nine. And then you feel good and you're like, okay, we have a couple more million if we want, if we choose to go at a veteran in the secondary, like we could do that. Or you could just do not, not do that. You could maybe add a few more depth guys, you know, with that last couple million. So 
Uh, I do think that this sets you up well for addressing a few of these positions that we talked about. And if that's the case, I mean, I, I think that's, I feel pretty good about that. I feel a lot better about that secondary. I think the me, frustrating thing is right. When you just look at the current roster, Derek, you just don't have that. And you're right. like, you just can't wait too long, you know, for this to yeah, happen. I've and seen I know the Cody. I've kind of seen like a bunch of people make this uh, prediction. Do you think that it's, the reason Blackman's contract it hasn't gone through with anyone yet is mainly just due to uh due to the fact that he's had some injury history along the way. And do you think that could be the case of no one's really gonna give him a multi year contract unless it's like two years, just simply because there's been multiple times down the stretch where he's been unavailable due to injury? I could see that being a reality, Derek. I mean <laughs> Say you're in Indianapolis and Julian Blackman wants, obviously he wants assurances. He wants to be here for, you know, three to four years. And you're like, well, if we pay him that much and then he continues to have these injury problems, like what are we really paying for? You know, you like, you want the most bang for your buck. So I think that is honestly a factor, Derek, into why, because you look at it, Julian Blackman's never, I don't think he's ever played in all the games available. I don't think he's ever done that in his career. Right. And this was the year we thought he would hope he was going to do it. And then obviously got injured again. Um, so I do think for the Colts, that does give them an advantage, like just saying, Hey, like, you know, because of, we don't know if we can rely on you or we haven't been able to rely on you in your, your, your career so far, you know, for all 17 games. Uh, that's why the contract's not going to be where it is. If Julian Blackman played Derek every single game, I have no doubt uh, the Colts would have extended him by now. Like I have no doubt because I mean, he's yeah. been available when he's been available. He's been effective. Like he's been a really good safety and he was so critical to you last year. And so I do think, yeah, I, I do think that that is a big reason a big hang up for teams because that is a concern because it's been different kinds of injuries and there's been serious injuries. So yeah, as good as Blackman's been, I, I, I understand why that, that might be an issue for certain teams. It might be a, Something they're like, we're not willing to dish out seven, eight million for you because of that. So I could see that being a reality. I really could. You know, and it's I I love I love the comments because everyone just automatically assumes that Anthony Richardson uh is going to get hurt next year. Um and he's a hundred percent going to get injured within the first couple games. And then there will be no season and everything else happens. Like I, I don't get why y'all are so negative about it. Like I don't get why everyone walks in with the mindset that Anthony Richardson had one season ending injury in his entire life. And here we are sitting here saying that, Oh, he's just he's just gonna get injured. He's just gonna get injured. We're gonna suck, and it, it and it moves on. Like if he gets a season in ending injury again this next year, I will one hundred percent agree with all the rest of you guys. But like, I love the amount of people who just automatically assume yes, he's going to get hurt. There's no doubt in my mind he will get hurt, and he will not be reliable. It's like, like, can you guys literally like? Ever, do you ever have anything positive to say in your ordinary daily lives? Like it just makes me think you're automatically always going into um, just the negative, the worst possible scenario that you could possibly imagine all the time. Sorry, I had to go off on a tangent there. Um, we've been we've been conditioned over the years to just expect the worst at this point. I mean, it's just <laughs> like if you set yourself up for expecting the worst, you might be pleasantly surprised. So I. I understand that uh, to a degree because it's been hard, man. It's been tough for fans to to sit here and just watch this quarterback carousel over the years. And it's just it's hard even when there is positives and then when there is signs of of things that could be really good. It, it is just I think it's just kind of a, a a thing that we've all come to where we're like, you know what, like. It's probably going to happen this way, you know, so I understand that when it's been so disappointing for the last decade, like I think sometimes you're, you can kind of get conditioned to, to just kind of just expect the disappointment at this point, you know, like, like what is hope really, you know, like, so I get that. I get that frustration. If we have faith and we will come, um, I just saw a, um, I just saw a tweet that said the, uh, 
the Vikings are looking to try to trade up to the fourth or the fifth pick in order hmm. to uh, try and select the their quarterback of the future. And I just sit there and I tell myself, like, I don't think going to the fourth or the fifth, uh, it w- would do anything for you, though. Like, I mean, we all know that the top three teams are selecting quarterbacks. Uh, so what's the point in moving up to four or five if, because (laughs) Arizona is not selecting a quarterback and then the, uh, chargers aren't selecting a quarterback. Like none of the teams between four and seven are going to take a quarterback. So why are we, why are they so worried about, you know, trading up? Probably just, probably just another team. Assuming that maybe like somebody else like behind them might trade up. I don't know, I but but realistically, I, I mean, who's it going to be? Like JJ McCarthy? Is that who they're going for? Like who's going to? I know, and you know, it, it's so weird, bro. I it don't get the JJ McCarthy hype at all. Like Peter Schrager went on, uh, went on, um, yeah, Peter Schrager went on uh, Good Morning Football the other day, and you know, he's talking about JJ McCarthy and how. You know, this guy, like we're talking about Jaden Daniels being the next great thing, but his team never accomplished anything. Uh, JJ McCarthy's team, you know, they went 27 and one with him as a starter and they, and they won a national championship. Like that has to count for something. And they said, no, it doesn't. You know why? Stetson Bennett, what never lost a game as a starter in his last two seasons with Georgia. And they never lost a game. They won two national championships. What happened with Stetson Bennett? Got drafted in the fourth round and he's a third string quarterback. Like, what are we talking about here? Like, you say, oh, the team won a national championship. Yeah, because Michigan had the number one defense in all of college football last year. They have an offensive line that was the best in college football. And he never had to worry about getting sacked. And he's playing college level players. Like we all know it. College football is completely different from NFL football. It's different in how you approach the game. Like, I just don't understand where the whole, like, listen, if JJ McCarthy becomes something great, I'll gladly eat the crow. I'll gladly say that he's actually a really good quarterback, but we get this all the way of like, we have this team that does absolutely phenomenal. They win a national championship. Their quarterback is, you know, like their quarterback is like, is good, but there's nothing about that quarterback that says, Oh, this guy's ready to dominate at the next level. Like that's the thing with these other teams is we see a Jaden Daniels who, you know, yes, he's had great. He has great weapons that he's throwing to fantastic. But the rest of that LSU team was not good. Uh, that The rest of his team was not that great. Not even close to Michigan. Like, Jaden Daniels is just a, a masterpiece of just these different aspects of his game that gives him the opportunity. I'm not even a big Jaden Daniels fan, but I would still take him over J.J. McCarthy just because there's more aspects to the game that I think he can – improve upon there's really only two quarterbacks in this whole draft class that I think have a chance to actually be really good in the NFL and that is obviously Caleb Williams and Drake May I don't think that uh that's been an issue and Greg I I love that comment because um yes LSU has a top 10 wide receiver they have two guys that almost could have been top 10 wide receivers but hey who re, Cody, remember when remember when Joe Burrow was there at LSU? Had Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, two guys that you could argue might be the best wide receivers in the NFL right now, both of them. Like literally. But everyone's saying, oh, Joe Burrow's not gonna be that good when he gets to the to the league. Literally almost won a Super Bowl, dude. Like, I mean, what are we talking about here? Like, again, it's the classic people don't understand what, how to evaluate the talent around a quarterback without like just uh, kind of thinking, oh, they had this. So therefore they're going to not be as good in the NFL. They didn't have this, which means that when they get in the NFL, they'll be better. Like 
nobody understands how to uh nobody understands how to uh evaluate the talent around a quarterback and whether that's going to help him or make it wor- or better or worse so you mm-hmm. know it is what it is Yep. And Joe Burrow was not a consensus first overall pick. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, he wasn't before then. I mean, it's the same thing as JJ now. Like JJ last year, nobody was talking about him. This year, I don't even know why people are still talking about him. He wasn't even the best quarterback in the Big Ten. Like, honestly, no one, he's not even, he wasn't even a top. Like, when you look at overall weapons, like he was maybe the eighth or ninth best quarterback in college football this year. Honestly, like literally go and check it. So, I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day, but Cody, like at 15, what do you think Ballard is looking to do right now? Because we have like, we, we have a lot of names that have been thrown to Indianapolis in that, uh, first round situation. We've heard Brock Bowers. We've heard Brian Thomas jr. Um, We've heard Quinn and Mitchell. We've heard uh, Terry and Arnold. We've heard Dallas Turner. We've heard Gerard Verse. So it, it's one of those things where I think that it, there it, it could go anywhere right now. Yeah. Does BTJ right. like BTJ? Bro, <laughs> I have been every time somebody abbreviates Brian Thomas Jr., as BTJ, I always get a crack out of it. How hilarious that would be if we did end up getting him uh, and just one day yeah. saying BTJ on BTJ. <laughs> that makes me yeah, laugh that'd be thinking sweet. about it. That'd be sweet. I mean, Derek, you know how I feel. I mean, y- you know that I want a pass rusher. I mean, but it's Chris Ballard, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I think the Colts should do and what apparently the, the GM thinks the Colts should do are completely different. So, uh, but I, I mean, what, what, what are the Colts going to do? I mean, Chris Bow, there's this Derek, for whatever reason, I feel like this has trade down all written all over it. Uh, just because there's going to be so many guys. Like you talked about all these players going to be available. And I can see Chris Ballard in the Southern twang saying, there was a lot of guys available. We had to trade down, you know, like, right here you know what i mean like i could see him saying something to the effect of that and it just saying you know we we traded down we got another day two or day three pick and we still got the player we wanted heck they did it a year ago all right they did it a year ago with juju brents didn't they 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 traded down because they were a high second round pick remember and they traded down to more the mid round acquired a few more picks out of it and uh, still were able to get their guy and so i could see the colts doing something to the effect of that, unless Derek, and this is a big if, if there is somebody on their, you know, scouting report that they've done, and we know they put countless hours at this point into this process. Um, if there is a guy that's like, oh, you know, like you talked about, uh, you know, Dallas Turner, for example, if Dallas Turner's like, this guy is an A player, right? Everybody else is a B plus player, right? outside of you know, guys we think could be available. If he is there, that's a scenario where him or a guy like Brock Bowers or one of those guys uh, where, the, where they somehow fall to Indianapolis at 15. That is a scenario where I could see the Colts saying, all right, we can't pass on this guy, right? That's a scenario where I could see that happening. Um, but really, I mean, other than that, I just feel like it's it, if it comes to where we think it's going to be, I could see the Colts trading down. I really could. So they don't have, I feel like this is one of the drafts, Derek, where they had the least amount of picks they've had in a while. So yeah, I can see them. You know, and we know Ballard loves them picks. So, you know, it, it definitely, that's why I, 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 that is why I 100% agree that there's a situation where if there's enough guys falling that Ballard trades back a few spots. Cause then if you can acquire you know, uh, an additional third or maybe even another second to move up a couple spots, then that would just be a great situation. Yeah, um, I'd be good with that. I'd be good with that if you could move back from 15 to 20 something and acquire another second or third. Like, absolutely. I would be fine with that. So, I mean, you know, it, it's 
it's going to be very interesting. And I, I, I really am excited for when the draft gets here. It's only a month away now. Um, yeah. It, you know, Derek, I jokingly said this, and obviously this is just me being a troll, but I was like, at this point, is it like, if there wasn't a draft, could Chris Ballard realistically go throughout an offseason at add, not adding a single player, like a new player? It was it was a joke. It was probably a bad joke, but it's like that's how it's felt. It's just like, oh well, at least we know we're gonna get some new guys in the building, right? We're gonna get some new impact guys in the building with the draft. And Derek, it's coming, man. It really is. It's crazy. It's already March twenty fourth, and we have only a couple more weeks, man. And then it's draft time. It doesn't honestly feel like it's draft time yet. Um, we haven't done a lot of draft content. We got to get on that, man. We got to get some draft content cranking out. Yeah, here. We, you and I need to so, um, do another mock draft because we haven't done one in like a month now. So, bro, this, I to- tell you, this whole Legereus Sneed situation, it's aged me like 20 years. I'm not even kidding. You. Literally, but, it's crazy because it's only been, it's been less than 10 days into uh, the actual start to the new year. It's been like 11, 11 days since legal tampering started. And it, Cody's right. It feels like this whole process has just like aged us like 20 years at this point. Uh, it just feels, yeah. it just I'm feels like to, it's been so much. So, yeah, that's actually a uh, good reminder. Um, so I'm thinking, Derek, I want to get, uh, you know, our friend Alex. I don't know if you can reach out to him. I forgot. I don't have a Twitter anymore. Um, so if you can reach out to him and see. Uh, just can you give him my number? Would you mind doing that? Wait, Alex, just, who? Uh, Hail Mary Sports. We were going to do something, and I forgot that I don't have his actual phone number. So I don't think I do. Um, me, so if uh, you wouldn't mind just giving him my number, and we'll just we're going to figure out. So here's the guy, idea I had, guys. Because Derek, I know last year you had landed on and you guys looked at all the different quarterbacks and that seemed like it was a big hit for a lot of people. And so what I want to do is I want to like break down some of these prospects with him uh, at some of these positions of need. So cornerback, you know, uh, wide receiver, uh, whatever else, you know, edge rusher, a couple of these different positions of need. We're going to kind of nail down some of the details, but just kind of break down some of these players individually and kind of talk about them um, and, and just go from there. So, yeah, if you wouldn't mind telling him that, that would be great. And yeah, we're I'll start- message him right now. Colts House with a $5 super chat. One player in particular to try to target in any way would be Tyler Newbin. I'm in the verse lot two camp, but so many people want BTJ need Q Mitch. All right. Interesting. Like I said, guys, I mean, there's just, there's so many different directions that Indy could go with this. And you know what, Cody? I mean, maybe it's a thing where, um, where like, you know, we have the situation where you and I just talked about it a little while ago about how Indy may feel comfortable with the cornerback room that they have. Maybe they want to go outside the box. Maybe they get a cornerback in the second round. Maybe just somebody that's another yeah. body that could potentially compete. But you know, that first round, you got to get the weapon that you need to be able to help Anthony Richardson out. Um, yeah, you know, Derek, could you see talking about corner real quick? Could you see a guy like a Cooper Dejean because of the injury falling to round two, like early round two? Because I know he's like a projected he, late round pick. Yes, and always seems yes to be those guys. I do. I do see it because look, the thing is, is that there's a lot of players that fall for a lot of weird reasons. Right, Cody? Um, we, we've we said it. I mean, it's... <laughs> BTJ is MVS. No, no shot you're making that comparison. MVS <laughs> and BTJ are not the same player. But uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, Cooper Dejean could be interesting because I don't think that Cooper Dejean is a guy that he's kind of in this weird scenario where you can play him in both areas, but like maybe a bunch of teams don't know what to do with him. Uh, And maybe there's some extra concerns about the injury. I don't know, but I mean, yeah, we've seen guys fall out of the first round into the second round before we've seen it happen. I don't think that be a scenario 
could that be a scenario where he falls, you know, into round two, for example, um, and then you look at him and you say, is he more of a corner? You kind of figure out what's his position, right? Is he corner? Is he safety? Right. And if you have a veteran guy that's there for one or two years, then he could make that transition into being the full time free safety. Like I, I could see that potentially happening. Um, but again, that is if he does fall, which he's so he's so talented. It's hard to see that happening, but it could. Yeah, it, it's hard to see Cooper Dejean falling uh, outside of the first yeah, round just yeah. because of like the versatility of him. Um but at the same time, like, you know, with the kind of player that he is, just to be a, like a late first rounder would still happen, I think. Who knows? Maybe Indy trades back into the first, or maybe they trade back enough spaces. They get Cooper Dejean, but get a, an extra second round pick in addition to it. And then maybe they could trade back up early in the second round and get the receiver that they want. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, okay. So let me, let me ask this. If there was any wide receiver, 15 to between 15 and 46 and you could make a trade anywhere in there to go and get those players. What, which one are you taking? Like in between 15 and 46, Dude. we're not talking. We're not talking Marvin Harrison. We're not talking yeah. Malik neighbors. We're not talking uh Roma dude. Adunze. We're not talking those guys. Okay. We're just talking right. anyone outside of that. Okay, let me just pull them up because I will forget some. I there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's a lot there of are them. So bro. many. There is a lot of them. <laughs> you could get yes, two in this draft class and feel happy about it. Honestly, I mean, dude, Brian. I mean, BTJ, dude. Like he is a freak, man. Like it would be hard to not go for him. Uh, obviously, Derek. We would absolutely love a guy like Xavier Worthy. Just oh, the yeah. speed alone. Like, and the fact and, that he's six one and he's still got like, he's still got some, he's not like a five, nine wide receiver, you know, like he's got a little bit of size, but he's just so blazing fast him or Adonai Mitchell. I, either of those guys, dude, I'd be, did I'd be you watch over the moon. Xavier Worthy's pro day. I didn't, I didn't catch that. No, they said, um, the speed, um, they said they were showing like clips. They don't have any numbers behind it. But if you just watched the speed of Xavier Worthy coming out of his breaks, I mean, oh my God. Like, it yeah, is dude. phenomenal. Like, when he runs slants, it's almost like he never slows down. Like, <laughs> it, it's insane. Yeah. And Derek, like, these are only a couple guys we mentioned. I know a lot of people say Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina. I mean, dude, the suit's 6'3". 230. So he is a massive wide receiver as well. Oh, gosh. I'd be all right with any of these guys, to be really honest with you, because there's so many ginormous wide receivers or guys that just have like what, what you would classify as like blue chip traits, like big guys, fast guys, guys that can do a little bit of everything. Like, so I am totally good with really like any of these wide receivers. But I think it's just a class, Derek, where, and that is also, Derek, that just made me think of this. This triggered this in my mind. You trade down, you could get two wide. You could go get another guy. You know what I mean? Like if you got like another third round pick, you could go get another guy with an additional pick. Like you would just load up on getting these wide receivers in that you know mid mid round to day two sort of range. Like I think if you do that, man, that that is just adding just a combination of just so much explosiveness to this offense that frankly, Derek, it needs it. Like it needs more explosion on this offense. And if you can do that, I mean, dude, just thinking about getting like a wide receiver that is a physical freak, like a six, four, six, five type of guy, and then getting a guy that has that type of speed. I mean, that's just, that's exciting, man. That is definitely very exciting to see how much you could give Anthony Richardson just in this draft alone, even with just taking one of these guys, dude, it would be incredible. It'd be incredible to just get Anthony Richardson as many weapons as possible. And then we've been a big proponent of that. Haven't we like surround your young quarterback with as much proven or even, you know, just talent in general that you possibly can. And so if the Colts can do that, man, I feel really good about the help that they're giving Richardson on the offense. Yep, it is going to be extremely interesting to see what 
uh, the Indianapolis yeah. Colts do with the weapons department for Anthony Richardson? You, you know for a so, fact. The- I have to agree with Colts House, whoever Coach Wayne likes, because Coach Wayne was a big proponent of Josh Downs last year, and you look how that turned out. So I'm going to trust Coach Wayne, who played the position for you know a decade and more, uh, that he knows how to evaluate wide receivers. So and he's been at a lot of pro days, Derek. So Reggie knows, man. Reggie knows. If there's anybody <laughs> I know I can trust, it's Reggie. Reggie's evaluation matters. Yep, very much so. And I mean, we saw. We saw Reggie was at the uh, was at the pro day for the uh, was at the pro day for Texas. Uh, you got to remember, uh, Donnie Mitchell was uh, there as well, and he's another hyper athlete that you know what six two, two hundred and fifteen pounds, but has athletics out the wazoo, bro. Like I believe basically the he, same thing as Alec Pierce, but. He was a 9.99. He was like a 9.98 or something. Like He's like right there at 10. Yeah, so. it's literally at a 10 almost. I mean, it's going to be basically the RAS Colts, Derek, if that happens. Like, there's just all these athletic guys, and you're like, all right, Steichen, make it happen. Make it, make this work, <laughs> you know? Yep. That's what I'm like, and, man. Just give Steichen the, the highest upside guys that you possibly can and let him go to work, man. I just, I look at like just overall weapons, um, like just looking at some of the biggest weapons, right? And shout out to the 700 people watching across all platforms right now. Um, obviously, I would love to have Roma Dudes in there because he's he's such a great work. He has such a great work ethic. Uh, I think it's contagious and I think it's a great thing that Valor would love to have. If he falls mm-hmm. to 15, I could see that being uh, the guy that we take. Um, yeah. Brian Thomas. I know that a lot of people are not high on him just because he was the number two wide receiver at LSU. But I think the only thing, I think the major concern with Brian Thomas is people are wondering, is this guy just an athletic freak? Or are, are they actually good with actually playing well um, in mm-hmm. regards to like more than just running speed routes, right? So sure. that's the issue, right, Cody? Is we got Michael Pittman, who is a pretty much everything kind of guy, you know, like he doesn't have top end speed, but he can run every route in the tree, which is a good thing for you. Um, Alec Pierce. For the most part, the one trick pony. His best attribute is his speed, his ability to run down the field and be able to moss people if he has to. Because he's six foot three, has a 40 inch vertical, and any corner is a mismatch if that guy's going 50 50 with you on it. Um, But that's mainly his only thing. Uh, Or if you're running him on drag routes, which he's able to use his speed in that regard. Um, Josh Downs, he's, he's got everything. He's got good speed. He's got insane separation ability and great route running. He's just smaller, which is why he's more of a slot guy. So you're trying to find somebody in that is a combination of all of these things, right? You want a guy that can run every route in the tree, right? You want a guy that has the athletic ability to do whatever. And also has that ability to create separation. You want to find the guy that does everything. Now, ultimately, who is that? Who is the guy that can do that for you? Now, I mean, if we're talking about it from the the guy that I know can do it, it's Rome. He can do that for sure. Oh, yeah. Now, will he be there at 15? I don't know. That's going to be difficult for me to assume. (laughs) He might probably not, but there is a possibility. Because remember, Cody, even just what was it last year when Jackson Smith and Jigba and Quentin Jefferson and Zay Flowers and all these other guys that were supposed to go inside the top 20, Jackson Smith and Jigba was a glorified top 10 draft pick, ended up getting taken at 20, right? So, you know, some of this stuff falls, you know? So Yeah, absolutely. So that's why when, when people like, obviously there's a couple, you're like, there's no way they're getting out of the top. 10 like but there's a few of those guys that are on the French right and it's not and Indy's right there you know right outside the top 10 so 
I, yeah, I would say never say never on these guys. Um, but yeah, Derek, I think for me, when I look at kind of where the Colts roster currently stands, I, I look at 15 and like we said, unless there's a guy there like a Roma Dunesen or whoever it would be, you know, like you kind of, and this is where I, I little get, I get a little bit where I can disagree with Ballard is like, I kind of feel like you pigeonhole yourself a little bit, Derek, into like, there are some positions you have to almost take here. And, and so that's why I'm kind of at the mindset of like trading back and getting more picks and taking more shots at the dartboard, if you will. Right. And knowing that this wide receivers class is going to be deep and knowing that you're still going to get a quality player. Now you may not get one of the top guys, but you still can get a guy that you can work with and, you know, st- you can coach up and all that stuff while still getting another quality player in another position. So maybe that's why I'm more kind of trade back at this point makes sense for Indy to do unless one of these guys is just, you can't pass on them. Like it's just, they're going to go in the next pick. Like there's no question, you know, like that's, that's where I stand when it comes to, to where, you know, the Colts currently sit. So, cause you would talk about corner and wide receiver are kind of the big two right now that you think Indy should go for, you know, but if you give yourself more opportunities to, you know, add uh, another pick, you know, another pick somewhere. It, it, it might be hard to pass that up, especially if it's the day two type of pick. So that's kind of where I sit with it. <sighs> I guess we'll just have to see, man. Uh, it, it's going to definitely be fun to think about over the next month. But uh, be anything else you want to talk about before uh, before we head out of here? I don't think so. I think we covered Alrighty. it. I think we covered everything there. Yeah, we talked about the Legereus need thing to start. We stalked, We started talking about the secondary and talked about what could be done throughout the remainder of the, um, you know, remainder of everything else. But hey, we'll we'll figure it out as we go. But thank you guys so much for tuning in again, everybody who tuned in. I, I greatly appreciate the support. It went just over an hour. But that's going to do it for this one, guys. We'll continue to bring you some more content along the way of what's going to uh, happen next. But, again, shout out to everybody for all the support. And as always, guys, go Colts.